Okay, good morning, everyone. Today, uh, the first uh, section in the morning is uh, background uh, statistical method. So basically, the um, purpose is to go through these basic uh, concepts in statistical tests or some machine learning uh, algorithms. Because uh, in the section followed, we are going to use Metab Analyst, which a lot of ideas being incorporated into the tools. So uh, although it's user friendly, but uh, you need to really understand what's underlying concept so you can understand the parameters and whether the result seems reasonable and also choose a different method. So it's a lot of button clicking seems easy, but it's sometimes you can lead into some silly result. So you need to understand what's the statistical concept behind it. And so Dave yesterday mentioned about the main ideas that uh, so we have this uh, spectra and uh, from this spectra we want to identify and quantify the uh, metabolites. Now we get a big table and yesterday we used uh, Basel, used auto, a GCMS auto fit and also used uh, uh, XMS online. So uh, for those of you who <laughs> didn't attend during night, we actually managed to have about 20 minutes actually the server works. <laughs> And uh, able to do that uh, de demo on my using my account. So, uh, but in overall, it's 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 just data upload is uh, a little bit glitchy. You need to really um, disable a lot of the Java security things, but it's doable. Just be patient and read the alert, and you should be able to pass all these uh, uh, steps, and then you can upload your data. So all the um, kind of um, the main steps and the uh, screenshot we provided on uh, yesterday's slide, so it should be fine. And uh, I hope they will fix the server and make it uh, more stable in the future. That's uh, what you can see. Now, uh, the task is we have a table of the compounds and uh, uh, their concentrations uh, for this untargeted metab uh, metabolomics. And we usually get a peak uh, IDs, usually identified by their mass uh, and retention times or retention index. So we want to do some statistical analysis. And uh, for the target analysis, it's possible we can map in these uh, <coughs> compounds uh, also to these uh, uh, pathways and networks. So we, we can directly uh, see whether there is some biological uh, process functions that we can uh, that's uh, changed in your experiment so today we're going to cover some of this uh, process statistics biomarkers and functional analysis and uh, so uh, the first uh, uh, I think it's uh, probably 20 minutes is about uh, a summary statistics statistics so we usually don't directly look at uh, all these values at tables uh, because it's just impossible to feel, uh, feel it is too too much so we need to use some summary statistics and uh, then after that we're going to do some basic comparisons univariate t statistics and ANOVA so it's very useful even for this uh, 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 high dimensional omics data these basic steps uh, still helps a lot give uh, us a first overview how much difference is um, just using this uh, simple univariate statistics. And uh, we need to also understand the p-values. This is uh, important because we are doing multiple testing in omics and how it can be calculated and uh, if it's normal distribution. But if it's not, how we can do some other approach to derive this uh, uh, p-values. So we are going to talk about some permutations. And this is slightly more advanced, but it's very popular. So I'm going to give you these basic steps what's uh, behind uh, this p-value calculations. So the last section is more this more uh, multivariate statistics. This is uh, like clustering and uh, principal component analysis and partial least square discriminant analysis. So this is uh, 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 this uh, last two is camel matrix method. It's very popular in uh, metabolomic state analysis. So I'm just make sure you're understanding all these uh, key parameters. So any time you find uh, there's a question, just raise your hand, just ask me. So 
uh, I try to cover these basics, but uh, um, if you feel uh, there's some more related uh, question, even if it's not related to this particular topic, just uh, you're welcome. Just uh, we uh, ask and discuss. So I'm happy to uh, try my best to answer. So uh, what is statistics? And different people uh, probably give you a slightly different answer. So for for my kind of for our purpose, statistics is just a, a way to uh, help us understand the data. So because data is so large, we can just not eyeballing it. So we need something to help us to bring out the patterns and bring out the most significant features so we can focus on uh, these features. So the remaining features or other things we can assume is less informative. So statistics basically help us to condense uh, the information and bring out the most important uh, things or sometimes it could be directly knowledge if you can under understand it. So this kind of uh, from data to information, the whole process, and we can talk about this statistics and people are talking about data science, data mining, and uh, um, also there's a lot of machine learning also targets. So in uh, we just don't uh, discuss what's the main difference between statistics, data mining, and machine learning. We all talk about the whole process. It's we so far I'm just just to think about uh, statistics. So. This is very general definition, but it's uh, uh, it's we don't need to know the subtle difference, which is not the focus. So, for any statistical analysis, there's two you need to really think uh, from the program or from the computer point of view. So, what's the input? What's output? Once you figure out this is my input, this is the output I want to get. Uh, once you have it clearly defined, now you figure out the steps, which steps or which algorithm leading to get there. So this is very uh, logical step. So if you're talking to other people and if you get this uh, input output well defined, it's much easier to uh, to discuss and to think about what's uh, uh, what's uh, uh, what's necessary steps, what's the al possible algorithms. So the output, you need to have certain ideas about what you want to get. Otherwise, you just have a data and you have no ideas. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's very open-ended. And you can spend a lot of time doing analysis. A lot of things could be interesting, could not be. It's a kind of not most efficient use of your time. So once you have a data, you somehow you need to have a even general hypothesis. What do what you think about? What, what do you want to? see and uh, use a pro appropriate method to help you to see whether it is uh, there or it's most likely to be uh, true or so. so there's a different statistical method that uh, help you doing this uh, uh, approach sometimes you really have no idea and uh, yeah you can do some very uh, general overview like uh, a PC or heat map can give you help you build some hypothesis um, but majority of uh, researchers and it's well designed, they have a clear hypothesis. So in that case, it's much easier to uh, do certain analysis. So, so uh, uh, this is talking about the data. So our, our data, we talk. Uh, there's uh, two main component. One is uh, quantitative numerical values. Basically, this a concentration table. Or the peak intensity table, or the spectral beams. So this is your uh, big X. The, the capital X is means is a table. It's not a single column. It's a long. It's a long, wide table. This is typically, if you're familiar with microarray, this is a big, uh, uh, big matrix. So it contains all numerical values, and uh, also. Uh, for our data, we're not just interested in data itself. We want to relate it to our phenotypes. So this is very important. So phenotypes is a disease control, and sometimes it's a time point. Um, so for, for most of the tools uh, development uh, or analysis, the best support is always a binary. Basically, we'll have two, two categories. If you have more, more than two categories, um, a lot of a lot of uh, statistical analysis actually 
doesn't work in that well because it, that's that's uh, also slightly more difficult to interpret. So majority, if you if you can put your design into a two class, it's a it's the best uh, way to interpret it and have mo most tools support. That's what I can see, especially this uh, uh, stati statistical test testing and machine learning. So this is uh, uh, talking about this x and y. So we need to have this uh, uh, both values pr uh, present in order to analyze them. So, so as I mentioned, the quantitative data is a uh, Basically, it's a, a, a data matrix. You can open it in an Excel uh, sheet, and uh, it contains this micro, like a micro array. Uh, uh, it's a gene expression intensities and metabolites uh, concentrations. And this recently is a different uh, uh, categories or so read counts. If you're doing this uh, next generation sequencing, we need the read counts. So the counts is considered. It's not a continuous value. It's a more discrete. So it's in general, it, it, you need to use a different uh, groups of statistics. So, but we are not dealing with this next generation sequence. We are not going to discuss about it. But it's basically uh, you need to consider different categories of statistics uh, dealing with the counts. And although there's uh, ways you can convert from the discrete to continuous, but uh, uh, it's a very different category. Now we talk about the, uh, the metadata or the your phenotype labels, and this this is basically zero, one, yes, no, and case on control, and this is the most common uh, data, and the majority seems to fall into this category, and the second category is called the uh, nominal data or just multi group, so you have one, two, three, four, and orders are not important, so this is uh, you can do some ANOVA and uh, do some uh, uh, clustering, it's all fine. So the third category is uh, ordinal data. It's like uh, uh, low, medium, high. And this is, uh, yeah, you can think about time series could be belong to this one. So it's orders actually convey some information. So people want to, uh, when they do the analysis, and people really want to uh, keep this. So. Uh, for the most of the uh, statistical tests, uh, at least uh, to my knowledge, majority of them don't really have special ways of dealing with. The best way is just uh, you treat them as a, a numerical value, just uh, one, two, three, just doing more like a regression things. So this is uh, how most pe at times the ordinal data has been dealt with. So you can do this. And, uh, but the other, uh, the, this is general way. But if uh, the other one is uh, just doing time series, that's uh, uh, another way. To deal with ordinal data. So uh, now I'm going through some terms or jargons and people uh, usually used in statistics. So uh, they, also, they often call it uh, what's observed values. And basically, this is our data. We observe, basically, we marry it from our instrument. And this value is called observed values. And a variable is a uh, characteristics of a population. And uh, uh, in our case, a variable is actually a compound. Okay, it is a um, uh, one. So for each data, we have so many variables. So a variable is a compound, a metabolites, or a peaks, as depending as using targeted or untargeted metabolites. So. Um, each variable have a range of possible values. This range of possible values de dependent on your samples. So if you collect about uh, say 100 samples, you can actually get a range of the concentration ranges. Um, but for, for metabolites, we actually uh, majority of common common metabolites on human, uh, we actually know what's the normal concentration range. So it's uh, it's um, quite uh, well known. So. We also talk about high dimensional data. So high dimension means we have uh, multiple variables. So for metabolites, if you have uh, 200 metabolites being married, you can see uh, 200 dimension data. So this is you think about uh, one dimension, two dimension, three dimension, fine. 200, you don't know how to draw it, but these people can call. And uh, when you analyze, this is a uh, computer guy who treated them just uh, 
Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, a lot on this, just use the term univariate, uh, bivariate or multivariate. So uh, univariate is, uh, we study just one variables uh, uh, one time, or just one subject. So basically we're marrying one things for, see for the, uh, just marrying for, uh, for blood, we just marry uh, glucose. So that's uh, univariate. And if you marry two uh, metabolite conditions, it's bivariate. If in metabolomics, we generally marry as much as, po as many as possible. So we call multivariate. So this is uh, uh, based on the variables, how many of them being married, you get it. So usually for our omics, we need to see uh, uh, at least 10 or 20 above, it seems that's if it's too few, it's not, you don't really call it uh, omics things. So. so uh, here's a, a kind of a, a important concept uh, I want to bring to your attention is that uh, anytime we study it and we have this, we crew the patient, or we uh, grow plant, and we are sampling from a large population and then we marry that sample and uh, then we calculate the statistics from that based on that sample but eventually the goal is try to infer the result we observed from this, this sample and, uh, see, uh, and put it within the context of big populations assuming um, basically our sample is a representative from the population so uh, how much confidence from our sample infer to the population? How, how much confidence you have? This is uh, very important. So uh, there are some issues, uh, and you can clearly see. Assuming our sample is normal distributed, and uh, if we uh, take the whole population, we took the same. We can we marry them, and we can get exactly what what it is. But in reality. We just get a sub small subset of this population, and we uh, get them and marry them, and uh, try to derive and what's distribution of this uh, population based on your sample. So you can see from this example, if you choose uh, basically based on your sample uh, approach, you choose different area, or you can have a different estimate in the top one. And you you get uh, okay here's distribution and here's variance and you choose the bottom one if you uh, the one you have much wider uh, estimation of the variance so it's, it's uh, this is all reflecting the um, bias in the sample of you know, of course we try to be as uh, representative as possible but uh, sometimes you just have no control and uh, uh, so this is something uh, the issues you can lead to the uh, Sometimes, if you choose the things very narrow, uh, focused on the like top, you can get very significant p-values. But on the bottom, you basically you have to use a large population to increase the power. So it's uh, all um, something you need to think about. Uh, this is population, but uh, uh, what kind of uh, uh, sample you get? It's uh, uh, sometimes it's hard to control. But this is. Uh, 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 reality we try to deal we try to infer from your populate from your sample to the population so this comes to this uh, very basic question um, how do we know whether the effect we observed in our sample uh, was true and uh, with regard to the population uh, the answer is we don't because unless we have we marry the whole population otherwise uh, we just uh, it's our best guess. So, how do we uh, kind of quantify our uncertainty whether this uh, um, uh, is likely to be true on the whole, whole population? Then one of the most widely used is p-values. So, the p-values to indicate our levels of certainty that our result represent a general effect in the whole population. So, this is uh, uh, why people are talking about p-value. Why it's important because uh, 
it gives us confidence. You get this this p values and uh, and uh, it's sigma p value means more likely to be a uh, true within whole population. It's, uh, So if we talk in the statistical terms, the p-value is actually a probability that the observed result was obtained by a chance. So uh, this, uh, uh, this, this, oh, usually this uh, threshold, you want to see this p-value is significant. Uh, so it's called alpha level. So most people probably just use default 0 0.05. And sometimes 0.05 is um, uh, give you s s too many significant metabolites. You can use 0 0.01, 0 0.001. So it's uh, all commonly seen in the literature. So you use this one, and uh, if the chance uh, is lower uh, than this value, and you the basic pra practice, uh, yes, because this chance of random, this random chance is very low. So we reject uh, the hypothesis. And uh, it declare the uh, the effect or the 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 result is statistical significant. So this is a a basic uh, uh, procedures for doing any statistical test. So we have this uh, uh, null hypothesis. Then we calculate the p values. This p values means what's the chance if there's no association, no correlations, or no uh, uh, no information in your data. So what's the chance? If the chance is low enough, and based in this, is what's enough is based on your predefined p-value. In this case, like a 0.05, then you think it's statistically significant. So uh, uh, a lot of time is dealing with how to calculate p-values. That's a uh, that's a key thing. In a univariate uh, test, it's more or less standard and straightforward, but it's uh, uh, became trickier when we have multiple. Uh, multivariate omics data. So I'm going to cover, going back to this topic uh, uh, later, but uh, uh, let's uh, start with some uh, summary and descriptive, descriptive statistics. So before I start, any questions? Okay. So um, uh, how do we describe the data? Uh, uh, for given a, a variables like a, a, along the concentrations from say from 100 samples uh, for glucose, and uh, it's just 100 uh, numerical values, and how do we summarize? Because 100 values is still too much for our brain to uh, to understand, to grasp. It's still too much, so we want to summarize them. So the most commonly used is the mean. And the variance. So the mean is their location, the central, the center of the data. So it can be mean, media, or the mode. And uh, variability is how how spread uh, is the data. It's everything is exactly on the same dot. Like all the concentration uh, of the glucose concentration exactly the same. So the it's very easy to uh, to absorb it because of one single value. So always on the same. But in reality, is the uh, um, the value is uh, spreading out. So uh, the more narrow the, the spread is more, the mean will more likely to sum, more, uh, more valuable to summarize the overall uh, the, your values. So if you're spreading a lot, so the mean is carrying much less value because you actually the, you have the other uh, values going to be uh, too far away from the mean. So it's uh, so we usually talk about the summary. We need to talk about both the mean and uh, or the median and the spread of the data. So these two combined will give you some uh, feelings about the data. Okay, but still we need we assume majority of data is normally distributed. We think about in this term always. Some sometimes the, the the distribution can be very different in this case, and uh, probably this not still not going to be. Uh, a good summary of statistics, okay? But it, as most time, it's working very well. So, um, and so the var uh, variability is one thing. The other thing uh, uh, that's commonly used is called the relative 
uh, uh, staining or distribution of the data within a spread. So uh, in this case, it's, you can think about this more robust mirror of the variance. They try to ignore uh, the outliers, like two at maximum or minimum. They focus on the thing that's more uh, capture the majority. So for example, it's a quant quantiles, quantile, uh, uh, Interquantile range, uh, uh, the the IQR, which is commonly used, basically the uh, rank all the data uh, from uh, one to one hundred. So the top twenty five, uh, uh, from twenty five percent to fifteen, fifteen to seventy five, seventy five to one hundred percent. They get uh, this um, uh, uh, quantiles, and uh, then they choose the one in the middle. So this more capture. Uh, for example, from the 25 quantile to the 75 quantile, they capture the middle majority and ignore the uh, tails and head. So this one is uh, more robust against the outliers. So this is very commonly used for uh, uh, for uh, for a lot of purposes. So it's not always the variance. So the uh, quantiles in the quantile range is very common. So here is uh, some uh, a gra graphic summary of the of the means and medias and uh, mode. So, if if in a perfectly normally distributed values, so the three should be the same. Um, but in this case, we show it slightly skewed distribution, skewed to the left, and we see there's some. We can see the difference now. The mean is a green one, and which is. Uh, you, you know how to calculate the mathematical means. And the median is a center. If you rank uh, 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 all these uh, values from the top to the bottom, and the median will be the center, disregarding the before and after. It's just the, uh, the rank in the center. This is the median. The mode is actually the value it appeared most often. So in this case, and you can always see the mode will be the value that uh, if you see the frequency uh, it's on the y-axis, the frequency, the top frequency, that one will correspond to the mode. So the mode is uh, uh, not as op op often used as uh, compared to median and the mean. So um, mean, media, and uh, mode is for describe describing the locations or central tendency of your data. Now the second one, as I mentioned, is uh, spread of the data. So uh, there's uh, a commonly used uh, uh, mirrors like a variance and uh, the standard deviations and there's uh, people sometimes is confused with the standard errors of the mean. So it's, uh, uh, I just put it here in, in case uh, just you know, to clarify. So variance is uh, uh, the standard, the basically the average of the square distance uh, to the center, and uh, variance calculated regarding against the mean. And uh, if the standard deviation is that uh, you take the square root of the variance, and this is uh, mm, if you compare to variance, uh, it 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 uh, it's uh, kind of have the same unit as your measurement, so it's uh, uh, it seems uh, in terms of interpretation, this is easier to interpret. It's one unit above and uh, uh, below as uh, compared to square. So standard error of the mean. This is uh, not used for uh, for measuring this um, variance stuff. It's just for uh, quantify the precision of the mean. So it's uh, this is taking into account of this. Uh, sample size. So you can always improve your standard error of mean by increasing your sample size. And uh, so this is uh, not confused with standard deviation and variance, so which is used for our statistical analysis of the uh, quantified spread of your data. Now here's the quantiles. Uh, mm, uh, most people use box plot. Box plot actually, uh, most commonly used box plot actually uh, uses quantile uh, 
to draw all these uh, lines. So the top one is maximum, and the lower one is mi minimum. And uh, this box actually is from Q Q1 to Q3. This is uh, as basically 25 percentile to the 75 percentile. And in the middle, the red, uh, red horizontal line, which is the uh, median. So this is the box plot. So I, I, I like box plot very much because uh, if you plot it, you actually have a feelings of your data and you compare all your data uh, uh, list them side by side, you can get a lot of, uh, basically this is a very good uh, quality checking for see your data, you need, don't need uh, the Y labels, you just uh, see your measurement, whether there's a strong batch effect or some sample just have everything is high, you can see all the shape of the quantile is all up, so you can see Mm, uh, you can get a lot of information by checking the quantiles. So if you feel, yeah, this is just slightly up or low, it's probably very normal, mm, normal variations. So the quantile, uh, the box plot is uh, important. If if something is obvious jumping out, it's, you definitely need some, uh, you need more attention to whether this sample is real, is outlier, the batch effect. So this is uh, uh, simple but very effective to do this uh, quality checking. So here shows the uh, mean and the variance relationships. So um, um, most uh, most of our, our tests and uh, like t test, uh, ANOVA, and a lot of things, uh, without telling you, they assume the variance between your two different groups is equal. Okay. They, they are in different groups like case and uh, controls and normal disease or so, uh, uh, they are different uh, you assume they, uh, they that's different uh, uh, to uh, different uh, uh, populations or so, uh, things um, the online assumption most likely is uh, they have the similar variance and uh, based on the assumption you can compare the means so in as I show it here if the mean is uh, very different. You think, oh, this is diff two different populations. You get very statistically significant uh, um, uh, p-values. So, on the bottom of this, uh, of here, you can see the same distance between the means, but its a variance is uh, is large. You can get a lot of overlap. So, in this case, your p-value won't be as significant as when the uh, variance is uh, uh, is uh, low. So. Uh, of course, when we do t-test, we have the option to choose uh, the variance different. In this case, the p-value also not has not going to be probably in, uh, it's not as good as this. But uh, it's the picture is not clear cut here. If you choose, you think about two populations have different uh, variances. So, but it's it's uh, what he says is we need to consider both the mean and the variance to see whether this is significant because with the same just the mean alone and you see the variance so the confidence is much higher when the, we have a smaller variance of the data so again we go back to the uh, goes to some details of the univariant statistics so we study a single variables and uh, uh, basically what it means is that uh, for all the object we just uh, focus on one of their characteristics like the height, the weight, and uh, their I, their test scores, and uh, if you if we plot this single uh, variables, and we have a large a sample, large uh, large pool, and we plot these mirrors on the population, and uh, if we plot in this one, uh, their height, and uh, the frequencies, and most time uh, if we uh, we are going to get a shape like this. It's uh, called the. Uh, this looks like a bell curve, and it's normal distribution or Gaussian distribution, and uh, this is uh, probably most well characterized distribution, and also describe uh, actually majority of the of uh, distribution in our life sciences, you know, in the uh, like in the human 
uh, like just concentrations, uh, height and weight. A lot of times, if you have a large enough populations, you do this uh, uh, plotting, you find that they, they more or less following this uh, uh, curve. So normal distribution is very robust, and the majority of times it's it's safe to assume your data is normally distributed. So the point is, how do you uh, quantify them? What where is mean? What's the uh, what's the uh, uh, variance? So getting this uh, parameters uh, is a is actually it's a key challenge, especially when we have much less samples in early days like microarray. So how do you measure the estimated uh, variance? And uh, just with a few uh, samples. So, so you guys probably heard about the Lima linear micro linear model for micro analysis. How uh, they able to improve the powers of that test get this. Uh, uh, Testing differentially expressed uh, express genes, they have this uh, uh, empirical basing approach. Actually, borrowing information across different genes increase their estimation of the variance to, uh, which significantly improve the uh, result compared if we just use a standard t-test. So a lot of our actually. Uh, Statistics is uh, a lot of focus is on how do we get a bad estimation of the mean and the variance so we can calculate p values. So uh, we always assume it's normally distributed in most time. So why we care about it? Because there's so many nice features about the normal distribution, and it's symmetrical, and it has the mean just at the center, and uh, also have a standard deviation, and uh, and the most people know it very well. If we talk about these uh, terms and values, and uh, everybody, everybody is uh, comfortable and happy if you think, okay, this is normally distributed, and here's significant p-values, and uh, and uh, people understand, they follow, they accept. So this is uh, one. If we can uh, put our data and prove it's normally distributed and calculate uh, their robust uh, parameters. Then we can do a lot of estimation or inference about this uh, uh, our data. So we need to understand it more. So as I mentioned, uh, most biological or physi physiological measurement is actually normally distributed. So majority will just uh, assume our data is normally distributed. And if it's not, we can do some normalization to make it normally distributed. So it's this a lot of effort to uh, put our data uh, into this. Uh, uh, category, then we can apply our favorite uh, t-test or and then several other things to to calculating the parameters. So uh, I already mentioned before about uh, uh, the difference. How to calculate means you sum everything and divide it by the number of the sub subject or samples, and you get the mean, which is very easy. And the variance is. Uh, uh, as a distance to the mean and the uh, squ and the square and the sum it up and divided by the sample size and the standard deviation is you take a square root so this is uh, uh, very easy if you're using R and uh, it's basically just uh, they have the name of SD mean SD or uh, variance so it, it, they calculate it for you so you just don't need you uh, to write all these um, formulas so standard deviation, a lot of you are very familiar. They actually know how much uh, uh, areas. So 95% is uh, almost uh, two standard deviation. Uh, is two st oh, the one standard deviation is 68%, and the two standard deviation is about uh, 95%. If you want three standard deviation, 99% of the area being covered. So this is, uh, uh, if we know the mean and standard deviation, and we know how, uh, how the likelihood of your your data is within this uh, percentage is, uh, is almost intuitive to a lot of people who know this uh, st uh, standard uh, normal distribution very well. Uh, in reality, we have our data, including metabolomics data, and uh, they tend to form different shape, okay? And uh, sometimes it's unique model, it, if, you pl if we plot them, and plot the values as and the frequencies values on the 
um, x axis, their frequency on the y axis, we can see this uh, uh, distribution across different values. So the leftmost one is called unimodal, <laughs> basically, you have one peak. And a lot of time, we also see the bimodal. So, uh, so uh, we see two peaks. Sometimes you see more, and most time I just see these two. I'm not quite sure uh, uh, things. So this one is uh, qu quite popular too, especially if we plot our p-values in. Uh, so this uh, sometimes you see this, all the p-values here is all close to zero, and the uh, majority of others. It's more evenly distributed, which means uh, your data actually uh, contains significant contain information, which is uh, a lot of significant features. So this one is, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not a p-value distribution. It seems quite a smooth, smoothly skewed distribution. But sometimes you can also see the type like this. And um, it uh, uh, it's, can be a exponential or extreme value distribution. And although there's uh, statistical models actually for this type of um, distribution, and a lot of times we 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 don't use it. Uh, we apply some normalization. We actually can uh, do a pretty good job to get this dis distribution into the normal distribution, and then apply our favorite statistics to understand them. So uh, now I'm going to talk about some common approaches to uh, to fix a skewed distribution so uh, because uh, normal distribution is mostly well known and well understood the one and uh, so we always uh, want to bring other fix other distribution which is not and make it more normally distributed then we can understand the using using uh, this familiar statistics so uh, for both gene expression like uh, microarray and uh, metabo metabo uh, metabolic uh, concentrations, and uh, we found out uh, a lot, most cases, it's a log normal. So if you take a log on the concentrations on a gene expression, it seems a much more normally, it looks much more normally distributed. So it's, uh, so it's just the uh, same thing. Uh, we found out and validated from <coughs> microarray to uh, metab uh, uh, metabolic seems <coughs> it's true and the m most time it's working well. Just you can visually check them. Uh, and uh, <coughs> so log transformation is uh, actually very simple and widely used. So uh, <coughs> so most time uh, we don't generating uh, doing a statistical analysis on the raw scale. We on usually on the log scale. We can always visually check in before and after, but this is uh, uh, almost that uh, you should you should uh, consider this a default or standard. You need to try that. So this is a, a log transformation on the real data. So the top left is uh, is a <coughs> some measurement of uh, uh, I think it looks the value looks like probably Antarctic uh, peak area. I'm not quite sure. So uh, uh, on the right is if you take a log, so you, you can see it's more less, much less skewed. It's more normal, uh, uh, normal distributed. And I'm pretty sure if we get, get more data points, uh, like a larger sample, it will be it looks more normal. But the the thing that's with the uh, limited number of measurement, I don't know how, what's the sample size, uh, but still uh, you can see there's a much better after log normal normal log transformation. <coughs> so a log transformation is uh, as simple and we should try first because it's also easy to understand. But uh, um, sometimes it's not enough. So in that case and we also have several other tools or uh, method to try to Further apply, or uh, sometimes people just uh, directly use it to see what's uh, what's the effect. So there's uh, beyond the lock. There's several other quite popular approach. One is called a centering. Basically, all uh, 
your data just subtract their own uh, and mean each variable subtract the mean so in that case it, all this all the sample will be a varied above below zero so it's a uh, it's called a centering most times centering is not enough uh, so they, they they will also going to divide by the uh, various measurement so the first one is also quite common they call it auto scaling so they, they subtract the mean and divide it by their uh, uh, standard deviation so basically you can consider this as a standard score z score so this is also quite popular after this procedure for all your variables the mean will be zero and the standard deviation will be one so this is a uh, auto scaling so this is uh, um, a lot of people ask me about hey the the heat map why this uh, um, my number is from uh, minus four to four or minus two to two so how 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 do you interpret so if you see your score is uh, symmetrical distributed around zero uh, like that most likely it's been auto scaled especially for heat map it's almost a standard so there's auto scaling. And there's also other uh, less popular, but it's, uh, uh, but it's useful in certain cases. It's called range scaling. So you can see the main difference in the range scaling is that uh, you normalize by the range from the maximum to the minimum or by the percentile and uh, uh, by, uh, by the different uh, various measures because sometimes if you um, if you divide it by the the variance, sometimes you put too much uh, correction factors there and and uh, make uh, some uh, so there's a big penalty on the very large values and improve uh, the significance of very small values. So uh, sometimes it is good. Sometimes it's not. So for example, if you have very small values close to the zero and more likely to be noise, you don't want to improve the too much weight. So uh, um, people can divide by the variance like uh, by the square root uh, or the, some other things. So you can... Uh, uh, there's always some uh, s debate. So if, uh, uh, if you're interested, here is uh, uh, the... I put this uh, this journal, this uh, BMC Biomax here, and they really debating about this centering, scaling, and different transformations, and what's the strength, the weakness, and on what situation you can apply. So I think you, it's it's very informative. Why and the author did a very comprehensive review and discuss and. Uh, but uh, a majority, most time, and uh, I suggest try the simple, simplest one first, and uh, because the more difficult one you do, it's hard to interpret, and um, and so it's uh, uh, if simple one can do the job, just uh, leave it, and uh, you can spend a lot of time um, uh, try, and it's actually hard to decide what's the best one. Only in very rare cases, and you say, yeah, this is a clear fit. But uh, for my experience, it's. Um, it's uh, it's usually not that clear cut. Yeah. How often do you also consider dichotomizing like a situation where you had like a lot of people that were working on normal? Yeah. You could have them as like a zero, and then the people that were the outliers, which would probably be the where you're probably more concerned with, and it might be important for them to code them as one, as opposed to having it like continuous. Like at that the first where you're talking about Poisson. Um. This situation because it's almost like the majority of people are like a normal value whatever that metabolite is yeah uh, <laughs> uh, that called my do means uh, what zero would, one. Do, uh, you, like, do look at what the normal range is in the general population yeah if you try like dichotomizing 
different transformations and still significant, then you're pretty confident. Yeah, that's uh, I, I, I see what your point. And then it's also more meaningful too, right? Yeah, uh, uh, the point is that here if we're talking about the concentrations, okay, if you're doing that, it's, it's concentrating actually real continuous values. If you're just doing the zero one, first I don't see it's uh, quite a commonly done things. If you're doing that, you lose so much information, and you see at least in this case, it's a very continuous range. I don't see uh, that clear things. If you really think outlier, oh, rem remove that sample and try to redo it. So um, I think, uh, yeah, in some cases probably valid, and always uh, uh, some clinical situations. I'm, I'm thinking about w what you described that, probably more like a Y variables, uh, how to get this uh, patient uh, phenotype uh, descriptor rather than this metabolomics uh, measurement, because this is uh, something that you actually merit. It's not subjective, right? If you found these outliers. Um, so I, I think we can discuss later. But uh, what I'm thinking is uh, based on the metabolic uh, range, this is usually uh, usually we don't do this. It's just uh, we uh, either if the outlier something's totally uh, seems normal, we just exclude them. If it really outlier, you can see it. And uh, but sometimes if you do normalization, you you just double check with the box plot with the heat map and the PC plot, and you see it's not that strong reason. So for the outlier, unless it's it's hard to clearly identify, unless there's a uh, very visual distinctive, and also if you have some biological regions and behind some collections and things, and that's more com comfortable, so that's the things. Yeah. Now here's uh, uh, some uh, uh, Basically, the ideas about uh, the compare populations and uh, and based on their distributions, right? Here is uh, uh, if we marry the height and uh, uh, two groups of people and we plot them, and we see that, and we want to see are they different, right? And uh, this is a, another two groups, and we plot them. And are they different? So this is a question we want to see, uh, gain some confidence whether they are two, uh, they are similar or significantly different. So how, of course, we 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 can see based on the distance between the means, and the first one is more, more different compared to the second one. But we always want to have quantifiable measurement. What's what's your uncertainty? How much? How much confident you have it. So we need the p values, and we here is two group. We need a t test. Okay, so now it's basically a t test. What he try to is compare the mean between two samples or two conditions. So so the assumptions that uh, if it's the same populations, we just uh, choose slightly different. Uh, uh, regions within the same population, and they should largely follow the same same means. And uh, if they are uh, statistically different, then we we can we most tend to agree they are from the two different populations, so they are different. So this is uh, what t test they try to tell you. So most time, if we really think they are from the same populations, they really should uh, more or less follow the same. Various. So that's uh, what I'm seeing is that we need to have the uh, compare mean, assume the equal variance. But in some cases, you, you want to assume a different variance. That's 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 it's it's also fine. But it's uh, you think about it, uh, assuming we have a representative the sample from population, and uh, we, so so we have a uh, different uh, types of t test. And uh, um, most commonly used, we use just the independent uh, uh, sample t-test, like a Welch t-test. And we, we also do uh, a paired t-test. 
So also for the t-test, we have this. Uh, uh, if for the non-parametric, is a Mann-Whitney u-test, and if related, we do well Coxon test. So they see all these names related to it. It's, it's just that you remember. Okay, we do have this uh, paired, unpaired for this uh, parametric and non-parametric test, and you know the names, and you can using R or using whatever analyst and doing this uh, things and this name associated with certain tests. So it's uh, so uh, the other point I want to bring uh, attention is that uh, uh, given the same mean, if you have uh, ways to reduce the variance, you definitely significantly improve your uh, power to detect the difference. So. Uh, here it is, shows this basically with the same mean, all the same mean, okay? And this is your uh, your, your measurement value. Uh, if it's very narrowly, you have very uh, small variance, and this is very significant. But you have a large uh, spread, and here it's uh, not that significant. So same mean, if you can reduce variance, it's uh, going to improve a lot. So if you are clinicians, you have the patient, you can we think they can be paired, and sometimes we found that the pairing reduce a lot of um, variance, so it significantly improve results. So if you can uh, do a, a paired analysis, or, or um, you can match the patient, or just uh, like a patient before and after, this kind of uh, for the regarding themselves. So this kind of uh, uh, parity test is. Um, Usually, much better compare if you treat them as independent. So, before I mention about this uh, two sample t test, and if we have a lot of cases, we also have multiple samples. So, if we have multiple samples, uh, what we usually do is doing ANOVA and uh, analysis of variances. So, in this case, uh, the focus here is not me anymore, it's a variance. And uh, uh, the assume is there's uh, uh, no differences in variance between the groups, and uh, uh, the we want to our test is actually a difference, okay? And uh, this time it's uh, uh, it's not t test, it's called f distribution and f test. So uh, ANOVA in this. Um, uh, commonly used, but uh, uh, there are certain thing, uh, a disadvantage with ANOVA. So people are after doing ANOVA. Yeah, that's t p value significant. And what's the difference between which groups? So this is is still left wondering. Uh, uh, what's where exactly uh, the difference lies? So ANOVA don't tell you that. So you really need to do an actual test to find out where the difference uh, lies. So. Uh, for ANOVA, uh, it's based on F uh, test. So, F test is uh, 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 testing between the uh, uh, group variance divided by the within, uh, between group variance divided by the within group variance. So, the assumption is that uh, if we have a significant between group variance compared to within group variance, then uh, we'll get more f values and we know the f distribution and we should get a significant p values so this is uh, uh, how f test it with is done so we can see the significance between the groups and uh, but we don't know where the difference lies so usually we need to do actual test it's called a post hoc test so there are several uh, several uh, ways to to design for post hoc test uh, to find out, but the the one uh, tricky part is if we in the omics studies we do this multi testing. If we doing t test multi testing, I know a multi testing is fine. If we do a multi testing, we can correcting for multi testing. But if we do this uh, ANOVA followed by post hoc, there's no well defined. Uh, uh, Approaches how you do this uh, multitasking, multitasking. This is no well-defined procedure, so not I'm I'm not aware of 
So a lot of times, um, it's kind of uh, help you to get get it where it is. But uh, if we statistically in this uh, omics level, what's the most uh, statistically correct way to do it? It's kind of still people just uh, just this is we talk talk about exploratory data analysis. So we see. Uh, this is a feature that's most like the where the difference lines. That's, uh, this this is fine, but it's just that in some cases, everything we want at a uh, beautiful, clear, single variable test is not directly applicable when you go to multivariate uh, omics level. So it's it's just a um, no well defined procedure to uh, calculate. It's just a, uh, the way. So like a t test, we have. Uh, Different flavors in ANOVA. So most commonly is one-way ANOVA. Uh, so uh, you have three groups, four groups. You can just do ANOVA divided directly on it, and uh, and we have a multi-factor ANOVA. So uh, we have the like uh, one is times you have different time, and the other one is the treatment and the non-treatment group. And there's also a mixed design ANOVA. So if we have just a single variables, and you can basically try all different ANOVAs on the things, but when we got an all mixed scale, so um, you're you're very limited. One way ANOVA is fine, as yes, you can do it. A two way ANOVA, uh, yes, you need more samples and do something. And the three way and multi way is, I rarely see it done. Okay, is be is it because. Um, it's very difficult to interpret, and a very no well-defined procedure to adjust the multi-testing. And also, if you really want to find the significant things, it's um, it's very complicated now. If you have multi-way and on an omic scale, so most people actually do just uh, if we have multiple groups, and uh, the best way is uh, it's just doing pairwise. You have group one, you have three groups. Group one against group three, group two against group three, or just the pairwise, and try to do a, a like a Venn diagram. So it's easy to interpret. Also, all this each step uh, statistically is well defined. So people talking about this, uh, all fancy designs, they want to apply uh, this uh, complex ANOVA on a, at omic scale. So I, I'm uh, I'm basically strongly against because this is just. An, no well defined the interpretation is especially talking about interactions on this uh, things it's just uh, so hard to uh, define a valid procedure and interpret it properly it's also the uh, if we want to get a good things it's a um, good result it's uh, the requirement on the number of samples is usually much larger so so conclusion uh, for the t-test is we test if two group means is different, as significantly different. Um, we can compare two samples, or compare one sample against like what is significantly uh, uh, from zero from a given value. We can do that. And ANOVA is compare more than two groups uh, of more complicated scenarios. And ANOVA use variance, the between group variance against the within group variance. So what I'm seeing this is because sometimes it's a, uh, it's a, the the idea behind it is very easy, and we can uh, use this simple con concept to help us do some comparisons. Even we are not use ANOVA, but we can use some of the approaches. Questions? Um, your outlier was really out of trend and you tried to normalize the data, but you couldn't really remove the outlier in the metabolism system. <laughs> Always interesting outlier. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you collect the samples, go find out why, right? Yeah. So, if you control it, uh, you, if you're just uh, in charge of analyzing data, and you still need to contact the person who collected. Why is that, right? If no clear reasons, it's kind of you see a strong, and you have a relatively good number of samples. Just exclude it. I do think that will help improve. Sometimes a bad sample really mess up your whole analysis. It's just um, the case. But most time, I if it's 
you said it's totally out of range, okay? Sometimes it's not that clear, and people just do this cherry picking, they just uh, visualize in the PC and say, oh, this one seems uh, uh, overlap, this one looks uh, causing trouble, they remove it, and they remove sample, they overlap, making them more, want to find it more clear. I, I, that's, that's not, uh, I would say it's ethical way, because in, on the population, there's some variation, some, in some cases, some ju subjects, it's just not that clear. It's, uh, we need that uncertainty to build in, otherwise you have such a clear, good biomarker when you uh, really go test in the population, it's not the case. So that, uh, that's normal part of the things. So it's really case by case, and uh, I like uh, it's more biologically or analytically justified rather than statistically justified. So the outlier is, uh, is different people have different uh, um, definitions. So it's uh, always uh, discuss with people who collect the samples and uh, understand the situations before you decide to exclude. But uh, once you have several hundred samples, it's very easy. You can stratify, you can focus on the ones that's more, um, more like you can compare w with more severe and to the more, uh, just have, you, you can get all the symptoms across the range and compare more severe to the uh, not, not, not so much, and you find most important patterns, you can stratify, that's, that's fine, but it's not an outlier, it's still, you stratify the population, right? So now I'm moving to uh, p-values, uh, still I mentioned about the p-values, so p-values, uh, probability of seeing a result as extreme or more extreme than a result from a given sample, and if the null hypothesis is true. What's a null hypothesis? Our null hypothesis is this. It's now no difference. The same population. What you, the, what's the pattern you see is a random. So this are a null hypothesis. So we want to see um, if null hypothesis is true. And we, this is a, a population st uh, uh, distribution. And we found our value somewhere here. And we want to see how do we compute a p value? So this is a, a issue I just mentioned before. So we know how to calculate p value for a normal distribution. It's a, it's a, it's easy because we have we know how to do a t test. We know how to ANOVA. We know their distributions. We know where where it if it lies outside these three uh, 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 three uh, three standard deviation outside your uh, less than 0 0.01. If we know this uh, chance of lying, uh, two standard, three standard deviation, we know it for the ANOVA. Uh, ANOVA we also know the, this chance where it included. But for non-normal distribution, and our in, our approach is not to model this non-normal distribution using other tools, then we want to normalize our distribution to the normal, more normal distributed, then we can still calculate using this uh, t-test. This is one thing. So, but still in some cases we couldn't do it, right? It's uh, just a, uh, mm, it's very uh, strange distributions. It's, uh, uh, so we can use non-parametric test. So, uh, so non-parametric test in general is less powerful. So if you want to get a, a uh, yeah, now I get get, get your point. If non-parametric, you just get a rank, probably just not a continuous value. That's also doable. It's non-parametric. So non-parametric is, uh, uh, yeah, in cases if you all the value is so uh, widely different, but you you only care about the rank. It's just who is more, who is less. You can use non-parametric, so this is uh, usually less powerful, but uh, if no, no, you couldn't normalize, so it's, it will be more powerful compared to normalization. Uh, so this is very, um, so the, in the last case is doing permutation test, so you, you don't even know what is, uh, uh, what's the distribution. Some, in cases, it's, uh, you're just not quite sure about the distribution. You can simulate that distribution and find out, disregarding what kind of distribution, you can still calculate p-values. 
I'll go and discuss it later. So here's the several methods that I just mentioned before about uh, we do the log transformation, do the auto scaling. These are two things we want to try. And, uh, and here the result on the, uh, is basically a gene expression data uh, or met metabolic data. That's usually you look uh, uh, before and after, you see it's pretty normally distributed. But if you uh, compare uh, with uh, before, and it's, it's, this is one, uh, this is you should be very uh, comfortable. Yeah, this is you can apply your regular t test or something, it seems uh, comparable. So, this is a, um, a box plot. Uh, we have this. Uh, this is you can see it is. Uh, mm, yeah, it's it, it. This is auto scale data, so you can see all each sample is uh, uh, symmetrical. Uh, seems it's symmetrical. So it's. Just... So for the non-parametric test, so we only care about the orders or the ranks, so we don't care about their. Uh, absolute difference. So for example, in I give the example is that uh, you have 1,000 and 1, and the other one is 1.1, 1.09. So in the non-parametric, the rank of the same, this uh, first value is higher than the second value, even the, in between the difference is huge. But uh, uh, what that means is that you have loss of information because the quantitative difference is lost. So keep in mind is that uh, if you choose non-parametric, most time it's uh, uh, it's not that powerful. But uh, if you cannot normalize, and here is the, and the, you cannot normalize, but you have a relatively large sample, you can still try. So non if you get the statistical sig significant values from non-parametric, it's 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 very uh, uh, basically it's it's there's a lot of difference there. It's, And uh, now I'm going to introduce about uh, uh, called empirical p-values. So this is a slightly more advanced uh, concept of calculating the p-values, or how much confidence, how much, what's the chance if uh, you get a value compared to a random. So this is uh, uh, useful because in a lot of cases in our metabolomics or other omics data, we're just not sure what's the distribution. And uh, uh, in that case, we need to simulate uh, from some random data and uh, calculate these p-values. So if you uh, read about some uh, nature, a lot of nature method, a lot of publications, they have a large-scale data, complex designs, and uh, you just want how they can calculate p-values because no well-defined statistical approach and you, you will find out a lot of time they're just doing some permutation, okay? Um, um, uh, the, the basic idea is that uh, be, be behind the permutation is that uh, the, um, the, uh, if we assume there's no relationships between your data and your phenotypes, and uh, then everything should be uh, just uh, you should be, just, if you shuffled all the uh, class labels, it, you should still get a similar result, okay? So if the original label, disease, or control, actually carry the information, it should, it should be standing out. Otherwise, if, you, if there's no relationship, it should be all similar. You're shuffling all the labels, and you calculate the T statistics, or F statistics, or whatever, the values you can recalculate it. We use based on the sh random shuffle of the data, and you calculate values and compare it. So if your values based on the original label is similar to values uh, you use randomly permuted label, then you couldn't tell whether your data contains the information that's at least the information related to your phenotype. It's um, statistical significant or meaningful compared to random. So in that case, you reject the, you cannot reject now hypothesis. Basically, uh, they, uh, there's no statistical significance in your data, okay? So that's, that's, um, that's the basic ideas. So, um, uh, 
so the uh, the the step is actually simple because we usually have very powerful computers. First step is just uh, you have the now hypothesis, and they all from same distribution, and uh, and you decided what uh, values you're going to calculate. You can calculate the mean difference, which is t statistics, or you calculate f statistics. If you're multiple groups, you need to c compare within groups against uh, between groups. Okay, and then we shuffle the data label. Basically, randomly shuffling, and we recalc we calculate uh, the uh, this t statistics or f statistics or whatever. Then we repeat uh, thousands of times, and we can see what's the permuted, what's the values based on permuted data, and we compare our original data. So this is a very uh, seems. It's difficult before uh, when we don't have access to computers. Now it's very easy. We can do uh, almost calculate p-values for any kind of uh, um, complex situations. The thing that we need to slightly more samples because once we need to permute, we need to calculate say, uh, we permute one thousand times. But if you have very small sample, if you randomly shuffle, you don't have many combinations. So if you just the six samples. And the combination is uh, very few, probably 100, 200, it's all down. So you, if you, you won't be able to get a statistical sequence of p-values if you have very, you don't, you cannot permute enough numbers. So re, so the permutation, the only request that you have relatively large number of samples, okay? So here's a very simple example. I hope you guys all understand. So this is just on the, um, on the univariate t-test, how do we do in a permutation, okay? Here is a, um, a, a statistic, uh, here's the values from a case and control, okay? And uh, this is original ID, so we can calculate their mean difference is uh, uh, 0.0541. So this is uh, just the mm, values from two populations, this original one. Now we are uh, uh, reshuffling the case and control. Basically, uh, so you see the case is 1 to 9, and uh, control is uh, uh, 10 to 18, OK? And we shuffle the label. So now the cases became a um, uh, different uh, uh, number of, uh, let's see, the patient uh, subject, and the control is different. Then we recalculate get the values, okay? So now we just redo the process once on time, okay? And uh, every time we calculate the mean difference. So of course we can do it manually, but you use a computer program, it's very easy. And we do it once on time, so you calculate uh, if we, the mean difference based on permuted uh, uh, case and control, and this is look like this. And here's uh, what we actually observed based on the original one. So we are pretty sure the difference between case and control in our original sample is meaningful because when we permuted them, they are not that different, right? So it's just based on this permutation. And how do we de get, get the p-values? So um, uh, here's the situation. If we do one thousand permutation, and within this down the permutation, three times we get, uh, 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 so uh, three, for example, if our result based on original time, original label is somewhere here. So actually three times we do permuted sample, get a slightly better result. So in that case, p value three divided by one thousand. So the p value is not, t it's empirical p value, or permutated p value is p, uh, equals zero zero three, okay. Uh, but a lot of times in this case, and we can what we can see is that uh, p value is less than zero zero one because uh, we didn't observe. But if we keep permuting multiple times, probably there's one times is still mm, you get a value that is higher than our original one. But we don't know because we stop at one thousand times, uh, so we we cannot see p value zero. But uh, we can see its p-value is less than 0.01, so that's uh, usually how the p-value is calculated. 
Any questions? So this is a kind of a, a very commonly used. So how if we don't know and we can calculate, it's still able to calculate p-values. Actually, this is uh, getting more and more popular because uh, uh, with complex experimental designs uh, and uh, uh, assume it's normally distributed, it's, uh, it's sometimes it's hard to justify. But if you prove using this permutated permutation procedure, and people will be more comfortable. Yes, it's there's a difference. Okay. So the approach is that uh, it's uh, you can apply it almost in any distribute uh, any situation. Okay. Also during the permutation, it 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 will take care of this hidden selections or hidden cor correlations, and the only disadvantage is uh, computation intensive. Okay. Especially for large data, if you want to permute one million times, you probably let it run. Uh, overnight, but it's not really about us because if we can do uh, do things and uh, we get a good p values, that's that's fine. So it's much. If I could just ask: Do you run the simulation in R? Is that how you do it? Or? Yeah, uh, you programming permutation in R is so easy. It's, uh, uh, but uh, the disadvantage is R is uh, if you very large data, you really think about it. At each round, you need to think about the memory things. So you need probably need to uh, just write a more efficient program because uh, if you do it one million times and every time you save the result in a bit in, in in between, you're going to have memory issues, right? Okay. Yeah, but uh, it's uh, it's easy to write uh, a permutation. It's the step is just like, like that. So yeah, actually, I already tell you the answer. Basically, uh, before and the example I gave you is compare the mean difference between the case and control. If we have three groups, uh, uh, time uh, time course or, or different things, how do we calculate uh, the p empirical p values? If it's not normally distributed, if you use ANOVA, it's not appropriate. How, do, how we can still calculate p values in permutation? In this case, we use the F test, right? We can still calculate the not mean difference. We can calculate the um, within group variance compared to the uh, uh, between group variance, and we can get this F values from permuted sample versus the, your own sample, and get this empirical p values. So this is two typical situations, but uh, more complex situation is still uh, doable. We just need to think about what, what's the uh, Distance you want to measure. So, questions? Okay. So here's uh, more details about uh, hypothesis testing and multiple testing issues. Uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, before. So uh, when we're doing a statistical analysis, uh, we always have a uh, Kind of uh, now hypothesis versus our uh, our uh, uh, so basically we want to see whether the, uh, uh, is how likely is the result we get is uh, uh, from the from the sample by the random chance so the so the p value actually tell you this random chance right so I'm going to slightly faster first it is. Uh, uh, I noticed the time. I don't have enough time. And the second one is that uh, uh, seems this I already mentioned it before, and uh, I put a lot of details here. We can, uh, if you have qu question, we can definitely ask. Uh, we can discuss it. So, so the now hypothesis, uh, uh, hypothesis testing is that uh, um, the p, uh, p values uh, basically reflecting. Uh, What's the chance if we obtain obtaining our observed uh, values if the now is a hypothesis true? So we reject it if it's uh, less than uh, cutoff. We we here I give you example 0.05 and 0.01. So if that's the if that's the case, and we declare it is statistically significant, okay. And the issue here is that we are testing not one once, we are testing tens of thousands of times. So if at one testing we are seeing this 5% uh, the chance, you know, we are going to get this uh, uh, 
um, uh, get this result from just by random. So 5%. If we do it uh, 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 10,000 times, so just by the random chance, we're going to have 500 that's false positives, okay? So this is a, a it's, we call it, a, um, usually we call it multi-testing issues, because if we do a single test, it's fine, but one is on omic scales, this became an issue. So we need to do some uh, corrections, so to control this high levels of false positive, if you're just doing it so many times on omic scale. So the most commonly used is a Bonferroni corrections, so it, it, the, the, the goal is to try to control still the same level of um, false positives or this alpha value, like in this case, if it's still the 0 0.05. But since we are doing this so many times, we need to, uh, so at each level, we have to really control it to be more stringent. So in the end, when the total combined, we are still uh, uh, within this alpha level 0 0.05. So in that case, for each uh, statistical test on each genes or each metabolites, we have to use a more stringent cutoff. In this case, uh, for 1,000 genes or metabolites, we need to get this mm, stringent cutoff. So it's 0 uh, 0.4 zeros or 5. So this is a very uh, uh, stringent cutoff. So in this case, yeah, the final p-values, we, we control these false positives. but uh, 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 so it's very conservative. In the case, we're going to in increase the chance of false negative because we are we are uh, taking a very conservative uh, uh, measures here. And uh, if we don't have large samples, and if you're doing this, basically, you're going to get a very few um, metabolites or genes that's significant. So uh, that makes uh, the multi testing you know, is not that. Uh, um, desirable. So then an another one is called the um, false discovery rate. So all we need to understand is that uh, um, uh, the false discovery rate is that uh, uh, we, w we accept there's a certain proportions of the genes can be false positive and uh, we, but we just want to control how much we want to we are comfortable with. So if we, for example, if we have a FDR is 0 0.05, based on what it says, five percent of these signature genes, I expect it to be false positive, which is fine. But uh, if we have much less samples, I see um, you can have 0 0.2, basically twenty percent can be false positive. So this is uh, more lenient and uh, compared to Banferroni. Actually, if you're doing the downstream pathway analysis, uh, gene ontology analysis. Uh, which is more tolerant to false positives. So which, uh, so if you have very few, use Bamferoni corrections, you get very few genes, you couldn't even do this meaningful gene ontology analysis because uh, you have very few genes or few, few metabolites. You really, uh, not, does not benefit from the omics scales. So FDR is very well suited. You can just consider the, uh, all the adjust p-values to the use the uh, uh, false dictionary. Uh, rate. Mm -hmm. So I'm summarizing our uh, basic concept is a T -val T test ANOVA, and uh, in our analysis, even we're doing omics analysis, this is still the basic. We need to visualize the box plot. We're doing T test or ANOVA, and see some signal features before we really venture into the multivariate statistics, and uh, so. I'm going slightly faster now. So multivariate statistics, we are considering uh, not just the one metabolites or two, we consider multiple ones. And uh, so uh, normal distribution is uh, just like this I just showed. And if you have a bivariate and normal, this is what it looks like. And uh, if we uh, think about three-dimensional, this is like this, four-dimensional, uh, it's hard to draw, and but if we're doing them, talking about this, uh, uh, sounds of features, it basically sounds of dimensions. So, uh, if we think about this uh, 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 situation, so we need really 
cannot just analyze in based on one facet, one dimension, just like t test. It's best to consider as a whole, whole, all these things, consider them their correlation, the structures, all things should be uh, taken together and analyze it. So uh, this inherently, this is, should be more superior compared to t-test or ANOVA. So this is uh, all, uh, all people just uh, um, uh, talking about the advantage of using this multivariate analysis. And the, the issue with, uh, with this approach is that uh, if we want to do multivariate analysis, usually uh, a lot of the procedures we want to use is that we need more samples to estimate all the parameters. But in omics data, we just don't get this uh, so many samples, so it's hard. See, metabolomics because uh, it's it's cheaper and usually uh, it's in a much better com situation compared to RNA seq or microarray. So we we still suffer from this uh, a small little sample size, but overall it's a much better situation because we have more samples. The features not ten thousand; it's just a few hundred, so it's easy. So here's uh, several uh, main categories of the multivariate uh, um, statistical method. Uh, uh, let's see. I don't. It's I put a visualization here, and uh, of course, so visualizing very helpful. So a main thing is that uh, camel matrix. Basically, we talk about this uh, uh, PCA, PSDA, and the other one is called the machine learning. It's uh, like a random forest, like support vector machines. And also this clustering approach is uh, all considered multiple variables at the same time. So uh, we're never going to forget about the uh, visualization because uh, all these uh, approaches give you uh, numbers. A lot of time we need a visual uh, inspection to, to see how the features, the distributions, the values to, to to help us make decisions. So visualization is always helpful. So just like simple heat map tells you a lot about uh, um, our data, the qualities, the patterns. So, so here the first one is talking about the machine learning. So the machine learning is two approaches. One is called the unsupervised, and the other one is supervised. So the main difference is unsupervised is based on your data, the X, the capital X. They don't consider about uh, your metadata, OK? Uh, the supervised learning is that they try to learn the correlations, associations between the X and the Y. So basically, they also uh, try to build a model, uh, con create a connection between this, uh, uh, your data and your phenotype. So it's much more powerful, uh, but uh, mm, uh, the supervised learning means that uh, you, you, they usually require more sample to train, to build a model. So it's more, uh, this, uh, we need more cautious when we do them supervised. It, it is powerful, but it's, uh, uh, it needs to be used uh, cautiously. So unsupervised learning method. I mentioned there's uh, two things just based on data itself. So it's a clustering. Uh, what we basically want to see samples of variables that are similar to each other will be more closely clustered together. And, uh, and so we want to see the patterns of, mm, we want to see the sub, sub mm, groups of the populations of patients that's, uh, that's more coherent. So this is some patterns or some information we want to discover using a cluster method. <coughs> also, the other one is called a dimension re reduction, like a PCA. We can also consider a cluster method, because on a high, when we project the samples into low dimension, and the samples close to each other, similar to each other, we are naturally close to each other. So it's um, uh, this is a, also an unsupervised approach. So, <laughs> If we want to do clustering, and we need to uh, ways to calculate the similarities uh, between the samples or between the object, and we also need to decide uh, uh, how close the uh, if they are uh, close to each other, the threshold. We think they belong to the one 
a cluster or one group. And then after that, we need to see the, how do we calculate the clusters, not samples at le level. And uh, sometimes we need to uh, start with some random seed because we need to start from somewhere to gradually build up the cluster. So it's a... Uh, uh, so uh, two common clustering uh, algorithms. One is a, a k-mean or partition method. Uh, basically, we need to first decide how many groups we want to have, and then computer will start with some, choose some samples and start to build the clusters. They can try multiple times, and finally they will stabilize with clustering. The other popular approach is hierarchical method. They basically calculate between all the samples, what's the distance, or all the features, what's the distance, and then gradually build a cluster, uh, emerge. Uh, the first is what's the most closest samples, they merge them. Then, uh, then and found the next one and merge them. So it's from the bottom up and gradually build up the cluster. So it's hierarchical clustering more, uh, basically don't, you don't need to specify how many clusters you want to build. You just build from the, every, from the start, every sample is a cluster, then final to the one single cluster. And you choose to decide where you want to have the cutoff. So here it shows the k-mean clustering. And here the color it basically shows the <coughs> relative distance between uh, uh, each samples. So uh, you can start with a random, choose the um, choose a uh, uh, this uh, cyan color, and then they found what's the next one, and uh, uh, the closest next one. Then if this uh, 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 the distance is within this. Uh, uh, threshold, they okay, they merge and build this it become a new class, then calculate their centroid, their new distance with other things. So the process just repeat and and finally they form into a number of class that you define. So the uh, this is a k mean, uh, the nearest neighbor is more or less the following same or self organizing maps. They do have slightly different flavor, but more or less it's a um, use specify numbers and uh, they have uh, tried to uh, um, find the distance and uh, group them and if, when they finally stabilize and reach the number of uh, class that you define, it will stop. So you, uh, there is certain randomness within, within that. But, uh, it's, So the, and then this one is most popular, hierarchical clustering. Basically, I start from bottom to the top. And uh, um, as I mentioned, there's uh, two similarities you need to define. It's what's the distance between the uh, similarity between the samples? What's the similarity between the clusters? So for example, most popular one between the similarity between samples is like a Pearson correlation coefficient. And you can calculate this. And uh, Similarity between the clusters. Uh, it uh, I'll show you in in the next uh, in later. And there's uh, how do you calculate a two distance between two clusters. So uh, similarity, and you can always calculate Euclidean dis distance between the uh, mm, samples. This is easy. Just uh, compare uh, each metabolite concentrations from sample A to the sample B. And uh, their difference, and uh, and uh, squares, and uh, multiply this distance. So you can do in a Pearson correlation. Okay. Uh, so here it shows that uh, the distance uh, here is uh, uh, overall similarity. So it's a, it's one, and here is opposite minus one. So this uh, distance is most close and most far away. So there's the things. Now here is cl calculating what's the clustering distance. For hierarchical, there's a common use is a, called a single linkage, is the closest one. And uh, so complete linkage is when they choose the one that's furthest from each other, OK? Um, and the uh, average one is the, they, f they found the center of all this class and calculate. So this is several um, common uh, approaches 
uh, calculate the clustering distance. And uh, if we do this hierarchy class clustering, as I mentioned, uh, we can just from the top to the bottom or from bottom to top. You start from everybody is a big cluster and gradually refine to the everybody is individual cluster or from the bottom, everybody is two cluster and gradually merge up. So they, you don't have to specify where how many clusters because you uh, they will do it all the possibilities and you can choose uh, for here you can choose at levels here for example if you cut off at here you can see there's two clusters okay one class is red and one class is more green is low expressed if you choose here if you choose cut off here you can see there's a, I don't know uh, one oh, there's multiple there's probably five different clusters so it's really uh, give you more controls and how you interpret your data based on the patterns you see. Now we're talking about the principal component analysis. So uh, principal component analysis is uh, the main idea is that uh, it's try to capture the most uh, variances from the data. So the basic assumption is that uh, main directional variance or the major variance from your data is uh, is your main data characteristics so because principal component analysis does not consider your phenotypes so it really tells your data itself so a lot of times if for example if you have a strong batch effect the first the principal component will capture this and say oh your data just uh, um, uh, the most variance actually reflect in the batch effect. So um, it is uh, just to tell the data the main direction of the variance. So this is uh, sometimes if your data is uh, not correlated and uh, the so if you have a data so like uh, metabolites or pigs is highly correlated and a lot of times it can summarize in just a few components, okay, just top three, and explain majority of your uh, of your variance within your data. And it's going to be very helpful to understand your data because the majority of variance is actually captured. But in some cases, if you your data is uncorrelated, the principal component one just explain about 5% of the, uh, your variance, and the PC is not useful because your data is uncorrelated. You can do a t-test, and uh, the projection is not a not designed or not useful in this case because your data. So what the PCA try to do is try to capture the most meaningful uh, section of your data. Even you have 100 variables, you can have 100 dimensions, but only the top several dimensions capture the most information. In this case, if just like you have your flashlight on a bagel and you see this uh, oval shape, this capture most uh, information for this uh, object. So this uh, dimension is most meaningful. We can basically ignore the second one, and uh, so this is an uh, assumption. Just focus on the most meaningful ones. So if we really look at the PCA, how they actually done, it's actually based on the, uh, mm, a projection from your original space to the uh, low space uh, to the uh, to the low level space. So uh, it use a uh, approach called eigenvalues. Uh, it's it designed for this uh, usually for the image uh, processing or something. So it basically designs that the first uh, uh, component captures most variance, and then the remaining one they calculate again they, and. Uh, just the caption and the second one uh, on the condition it's not related to the first one. So the, actually each component in the, in, is independent to each other, but each component uh, try to capture the, as much as uh, variance as possible. So uh, we don't need to go to the um, algorithm details, but uh, uh, here I want to say is here is that T is basically your score and P is uh, um, your loading. Basically, strong p-values contribute uh, more to your score, the locations within the sample. So this is, uh, we don't need to know, but this is uh, uh, your metabolite concentrations, and this is your score, and this is your loadings, and it should be t, okay, somehow. 
So uh, PCA details I already mentioned. It's uh, try to capture the maximum variance, but keep each component orthogonal to other. So uh, so each each component is uh, orthogonal means it's a second component and the first component. If you see that, it's basically it's a uh, 19 degrees, and we try to capture there. Most variance is actually in the red one, and the second one is in the uh, green one. So principal component analysis can be uh, can be applied on a covariance matrix, or also can be on a correlation matrix. So this is uh, your choice, and uh, if you apply the auto scaling, co covariance and correlation will be actually the same because it's all, uh, because our unit is one. If you divide it by variance of one, it's not really change. So as I mentioned, uh, the uh, this one's originally developed for the face recognition. So if you just uh, capture uh, this the details of the face and actually use the eigen face, it's basically you just capture the main uh, generical face features. So metabolomics is a very well suitable for doing this uh, PCA or chemometric method because uh, um, the spectral features on metabolites is uh, it's more correlated. It's uh, my feeling compared to microarrays to metabolites. The correlation with the metabolites um, or metabolic this, uh, peaks is much stronger. So if we do the uh, PCA analysis, the variance capturing in the first few components um, is larger compared to microarrays. So it's, uh, it's, that's why uh, some omics have different um, characteristics. So the PCA, PLC is well suited for metabolomics. So here we apply all these uh, peaks. We can do this uh, um, PCA. We can clearly see uh, the score plot. They have different uh, clustering. It's well based on the uh, patient uh, groups. Okay. And uh, uh, as I showed before, the, we can actually see which uh, loadings or which coefficient actually contribute to this separation. And in this case, we usually need to read the loading plot. So here is a side by side between scores and loadings. And uh, uh, each color represents groups. And uh, if we do the PC1, PC2, and loading 1, loading 2 side by side, we actually can see which compounds or which in this case is basically um, minerals or some other features all in combined co co contributed to this one. So this area will be positively correlated to this green one because this one is actually uh, try to drive the separate in this direction. Okay, So this one and this features will be positively correlated because they, this one drive the separation. So we can also see this feature and uh, the green feature will be negatively correlated because they are opposite direction. And this is um, an intuitive explanation of how to uh, and see the scores and loadings. So that's very easy. So if PCA gave you good patterns, and uh, basically you are very safe because PCA is uh, uh, Unsupervised, the patterns tell the data. So this data inherently is uh, have the patterns. It's if the patterns overlap with your um, phenotype dif uh, phenotype labels, it basically tells tells is a strong your biggest uh, patterns or variance within your data is actually your experimental factor. So it's very safe. But in sometimes this is not, uh, and you probably need to use more. Powerful approach, a small supervised approach. This is going to be uh, called PLSDA. So for the PCA, it's uh, very good for data overview, for detect outlier, and uh, looking at the relationship between the variables. So it's very. It should be PCA heat map should be, heat map and box plot should be your uh, your friends to uh, check the data quality is outlier de detections. And uh, also, if a PCA give you a good result, that's that's very uh, very good because that's a PCA is a, a relatively safe to use. Um, but if not, you need to use another approach called a PLSDA. So the biggest difference between the PLSDA and the PCA is that uh, 
PLSD is supervised, it considers both your data and uh, your data label, which is y-axis, uh, y basically case and control uh, your, your, your phenotypes, okay? It try to create the model to correlate them. So it, it, it's nice, but uh, a lot of times we found that PLSDs tend to try to, it's too eager to please you. It will always produce this uh, separation patterns with regard to your condition. So even you give a random, it will try to produce a separation pattern. Visually, you see, wow, there's separations in your PC, but wait, don't be, don't be too overexcited. So there's several um, things you need to double check, make sure it's justified, okay? Uh, first is a PC, PLSD always produce better separation compared to PC. So I hear that so it's just using the table analyst is that uh, you can see it is uh, uh, every time you apply PLSD you get it better. Okay? So because it's supervised, it's expected, it's nothing um, uh, so we need to double check, okay? Here is the uh, one is PLSD is uh, sub, sub susceptible to a, a phenomenon called overfitting. Overfitting basically, there's no pattern. They could try to find the pattern for you, okay? So this one we need to uh, guard against whether this pattern is true or not. So in machine learning field, they have very well-developed approach called cross-validation. So what they try to do is that they hold all the samples, they divide the samples into uh, different groups, and build a model in one group and test in another one. So the one I showed here is that a three-fold cross-validation. So they use a chain. Uh, they can do a th so. So they have two thirds of samples for the chaining and testing the uh, test sample. Then uh, doing another two thirds and test. So they do it in three rounds and calculate the performance. And this is fine if you have a large number of samples. If you have very small number of samples. And uh, if you're doing, putting it one third, one third, you're probably not going to get uh, enough sample to chain your data. So if you have less number of sample, you use an approach called leave one out cross-validation. So if you have 20 samples, you're going to do 20 rounds of uh, uh, build model and predict, build model and predict. So you, this basically is called leave one out. So, uh, so this this uh, this is called cross validation. So the, the thing that try to prevent whether if the, if it's a fake this pattern, uh, the prediction won't be as good. So this is one thing. Okay, the the PLSD in P, the cross validation in P, PLSD also have another um, purpose is that uh, how many components we can use for PLSD to build a model because just like PCA. PLSD is uh, the first PLSD component. It's uh, not called a principal component. It's called a latent component. It's, it's most predictive. But uh, sometimes the second one is also predictive. The third one is pre also predictive. It's, not, it's less predictive, but it's sometimes it still contributes to your model. So you, you need to decide how many components can be used to build your model. So um, this cross-validation is the first as a guard against the overfitting. And second is try to decide if I'm using how many components can achieve a good, um, good performance. So for PSDA, there's a, a, a cross validation is a, the a, a prediction is one thing. They also is called a, a, a sum of the squares captured by the model. So this is a, another. A, measurement of how good of your model. So you, you, you build your model, you have to explain the variance within your uh, covariance within your data and, and y. So this is called R square. And because we're doing uh, cross validation, we can also know uh, cross valid R square. So if we use the model as during cross validation, how much we explain the covariance. So it's called Q square. So we can also this is R square, Q square, and prediction accuracy. This is three performance measures if you're doing PLSDA. So this one can help us to decide whether our model is a good model or overfitting model, whether it contains. And also, PLSDA is 
so easily overfit. So another second one is permutation test. So uh, I'm not going to cover details. It's the same thing exactly I covered uh, before about the t-test. But here we're just uh, computing on the PRS DVA model because uh, permutation is uh, is very easy. We just uh, computing this uh, q square, r square, or even predicting accuracy on the permutated data. Basically, we shuffle the label and redo it. So if we also we can see uh, the statistic based on the permutation and the based on original data, we can get this. So we have cross validation and the permutation double check to whether to see whether this PLSD is uh, is a valid model. Tell us more information. So these two approaches. So if both seems give a very good result, now we are safe. Our PLSD model works, and uh, so that's that's. Uh, uh, don't just uh, show a PRSD uh, separation with not reporting this uh, uh, mirrors. A review is definitely going to question how valid um, it is. So in better report other Q square, R square on the uh, permutations. So this is make it more credible for this model. So it is very different from just using PCA. And for PRSD uh, things, we uh, we can we can do use the like PCA doing like scores and loadings, but uh, a popular one is called a VIB plot. It's called a variable importance in projection. So uh, uh, usually people just have a cut of VIP larger than one is uh, significant features. So here's the result we 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 can get if we use metabolic analyst. You you can see uh, based on. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot of actually larger than one, so you can choose about top. You don't have to choose all of them. Here's uh, uh, here's uh, features that's uh, more than oh, 1.0. So the other one, they have this uh, small squares to tell you the um, expression within each categories. I have a question about the performance. How do you measure performance? Is it based on the traditional or based on the significance? Yeah, uh, here's the three. We actually do all of them. Uh, prediction accuracy or error rate, which is uh, there. A uh, cross validated R square or Q square as three. I got it. So those all related to the prediction error, so basically. Um, yeah, cross validated Q square and prediction is all prediction. The first one is uh, just based on the model itself. The first one, the R square, is not prediction. The last two is. So the higher, the better. You can always see that. And plus uh, permutation, okay, both. So it's uh, because the uh, PLSD is uh, um, not have a good reputation. But PLSD is uh, initial; it's not designed for this prediction. But it's somehow uh, people just want to use it. So we need to pay pay more attention to it. So it's not like uh, compared to a random forest uh, support vector machine. PLSD is uh, uh, very susceptible to this uh, overfitting things. So that's we. So uh, we mentioned about this is a uh, binary, it's a yes or no, and a control case or even one. But if we can also do it on a regression, but on a regression, it's uh, uh, it's we use another different approach called the root mean squared errors. Basically, we calculate our predicted predicted values compared to the original, and so much difference. But uh, this is not commonly done uh, in classification. We mainly focus on the it's yes or no, so it's not a regression. It's at least uh, we don't do as much as uh, classification. So here's uh, how do we measure classification result, and it's accuracy and error rate. Accuracy is a percentage of times we get this right, so it's very easy. But uh, 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 this classification just based on accuracy error is. Uh, it's problem if we have uh, this imbalanced data, right? So if we have uh, populations, the majority is healthy, and one or two is um, a patient, if we predict everybody is healthy, we get a very high accuracy, but it's useless because uh, this is imbalanced. So uh, in terms of evaluating performance, if we want to do biomarkers on the clinical settings, and there's more, po they use a different set of things, they call the 
sensitivity and uh, specificity. So, and uh, so we have true positive rate and neg um, uh, true negative rate. So here is a uh, true positive is actually is positive, and we predict is positive. It's true positive, and if actually is negative, we predict negative is true negative. So this is uh, uh, clinically we see how it's been done. So. Uh, for example, if we have populations, we have a cutoff here. So uh, on, on this cutoff, left side is negative, and the right side is positive. So for this one, it's a true negative. Okay, Here, it's going to be uh, false negative, because if it's a green, and it's a positive case, but we have a cutoff here, so it's a false negative. And uh, here, it's going to be a true positive, but this uh, red tails on the right hand side, Red tail under this red red stains here's a false positive. So based on this, a uh, true positive, false positive, we can calculate the uh, sensitivity specificity, and uh, these are different uh, uh, for the things for biomarkers. So if we calculate these values, actually we can easily uh, create a curve. It's called a raw curve. It's receiver operating characteristic curves. So it's very popular in biomedical applications. If you use raw curve, and uh, we don't need to worry too much about the imbalanced data because the true negative, true positive is all built within. And uh, so, as I mentioned, we are already able to calculate them. So we have these uh, populations. We use different cutoff, and we can create these false positives, true positives, and uh, uh, false positives. And create a dot. We connect them, and this is our C curve. So it's a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. And we have here we have a very high specificity but low sensitivity. We have here is very high sensitivity, low specificity, and here is the trade-off. So a lot of times people think about uh, the uh, the the point here closest to the uh, top left is most optimal cutoff to do the diagnosis because it have a balance, have the high sensitivity and the high specificity, okay? But in some cases, people probably choose uh, a different one to have a much higher specificity, even less sensitivity. So it's really a case by case and uh, how do we choose it? So for the sensitivity specificity, that's one measure. We want to capture it in one value. It's called area on the ROC curve. So it's overall measure of the performance. So we have the good test that we can do a 95% uh, AUC. We, if it's 100%, it's uh, perfect always. So, and if a random sample, it is 15%. Uh, it's like a diagonal. So the 70% is probably. It's uh, I see a lot of um, report about the 70% or something. So this uh, for clinical use is not enough. You should be uh, pushing to I don't know 18. Above, so it's 75 percent you can publish, but it's still not enough to use things. So I mentioned about this uh, PLSDA, and uh, which is part of actually a machine learning me method. But there's a uh, other supervised classification me method called the uh, Simca OPLS, support vector machine, random forest, and neural networks. This is all powerful things, and uh, within MetaBanalyst, actually there's uh, several of them I put there. And uh, you are welcome to explore. If you have questions, you can ask me. But I'm not going to cover them for this lecture. It's just we're already over time now. So, so the data, uh, so the supervised is uh, very uh, powerful, but it usually require more samples. Okay. So, uh, the generally uh, progress is. Uh, we want to start with the uh, PCA and see whether the cluster naturally cluster is separating well. If that's fine, and the PCA should be enough to fit your needs. But if you want to do predictions, and you should use supervised method. But also you need to pay attention supervised me method. You need more data. And if you don't want to do prediction, you want to just want to test to find the significant features. You just do a simple statistical test. The t-test uh, ANOVA should be fine. And um, so don't naively, the caution is just don't naively use uh, uh, a lot of, with limited data, don't naively use a lot of supervised approach because it tend to overfit. 
and you don't pay attention to it, and you just uh, so excited to write her papers, and most of the review will come back and uh, um, give you some comment. You probably don't have not happy to to address it because it seems you don't quite understand. That didn't address these overfitting things, and just over excited about the result. So you basically, uh, try the simple first if you're doing supervised, and make sure you're doing this cross validation and the permutations and the, um, all the report all these. Uh, uh, values and uh, that's people will be more uh, make sure this is robust okay so, so. question yeah when you do power calculations how do you decide that because you're, you're in you're power calculation yeah, like for grants or like for <laughs> power calculation okay uh, this is not covered, but uh, within metabol analysts, it do have a power calculation. Okay, the power calculation in omics is uh, is always difficult, and uh, the best one is I found is you have a pilot data. Okay, you have pilot data either from a small uh, scale study from your own research, or from a published data, but very close to what you are going to study, and uh, then you can do a power cal calculation on the effect size. And uh, if you have a certain cutoff values, it will give you how many uh, number of samples you're going to get. And this metabolic analysts actually do have the modules, and you can try and you can ask me questions. So it's, you need to have a have certain data to estimate the parameters. Yeah. Just one quick question. So after your PCA, you still could do you still could establish your false discovery rate. In later analysis, depending on, on what tools you're going to use. So PCA is for the pattern, and doesn't really tell you anything about the significance. So you don't even false discovery is not even relevant here because PCA just give you patterns that right. don't declare anything. Right. So you couldn't blame PCA for anything. Okay, it's your right. visual stuff, right? Right. Yeah. But could you later in your data analysis could you at least establish you know? You, uh, what you think is a meaningful false discovery rate, like a cutoff of what you're going to consider and what you're not. Um, no, you if you any cutoff is more is supervised, just like a t test. Okay. So PCA, if you want to do based on the patterns of PCA doing the things, you need to do, you you need to do like a like a further statistical test yeah. on the PCA patterns, which is it's it's separate, so it's not PCA anymore. But you can always do something based on the PCA panel. Panel, that's fine. It's, yeah.